If your job requires you to connectorize cables, then you are probably required to TDR those cables as well. This video covers how to perform the function of a TDR with a pulse generator and an oscilloscope. Understanding the material in this video will help you to un understand the theory of how an actual TDR works. Let's say we have a signal generator at one end of a cable and the other end is left open. At time zero, we send the incident pulse. The pulse travels down the line and gets reflected back at time 10 nanoseconds. If the time it takes the signal to travel to the end of the line and back is larger than the pulse width, that was sent, you will be able to see two distinct pulses at your measurement point. In reality, the pulse width will be larger than the time it takes the signal to travel to the end of the line and back. So there will be some overlap of the incident and reflected pulse. With that said, Watch what happens as I increase the pulse width. At a pulse width of 10 nanoseconds or greater, the incident and reflected pulses are summed together. This is because the reflected pulse of an open transmission line is in phase with the incident pulse. As the pulse width is increased, there is more overlap. This is the width of the incident pulse, and this is the width of the reflected pulse, and this is where the incident and reflected pulses add together. Now, let's take a look at using a scope as a TDR in order to help get a better understanding of TDR theory. First of all I got a pulse generator and I set the frequency to 100 kilohertz. I set the pulse width to 500 nanoseconds and the amplitude to 1 volt. I want uh, only a positive going pulse, so I set an offset of 500 millivolts. And if we look at the scope, uh, we can see that if I uh, show the ground reference, we can see that I do have a positive going pulse. And notice that the pulse takes up two vertical divisions and my volts per division is one volt. So that means we have an amplitude of two volts. Uh, but how can that be if I set the amplitude to one volt? Uh, well what's happening is that we have a pulse uh, that is traveling um, from the pulse generator it uh, comes up, it sees this uh, open circuit and the reflection returns at approximately the same time the incident pulse was sent. So we are essentially looking at both the reflected and incident pulses uh, directly on top of each other adding to two volts. When I connect the second cable onto the T connector, we now see a more complicated pulse. Now this cable is quite a long cable. In fact, uh, it is about uh, 16 and a half feet. So to understand why we see this pulse, we have to think in terms of what the scope sees over time. 
At time t1, the scope sees the rising edge of the incident pulse. At time t2, the pulse has already traveled to the end of the cable, but the scope still only sees the incident pulse. At time t3, the reflection that resulted from the open cable has traveled back down the line and the scope now sees the incident and reflected pulses adding together. Time T4 is the time of the trailing edge of the incident pulse. We still see the reflection because it ha has not finished returning from the end of the cable. Time T5 is the time where the trailing edge of the reflection occurs. Now we can actually determine the length of the cable by uh, using a calculation um, and in the calculation we need to know the time from the rising edge of the incident pulse to the time that we see the reflection. So to do this, uh, I can use the times 10 function on the oscilloscope to get a better look at that, um, that part of the waveform. And uh, just to get a little bit more accuracy, I can turn my volts per division to 0.5 volts. And uh, basically, uh, I like to measure, I find I get the most accuracy by measuring at the 50% portions of the rise times. So uh, basically, I'll just move these so it's easy to read. And what we have here is one, two, three, four, five. And we have about 0.2, so we have about 50 to nanoseconds. So the speed of light in free space is approximately 11.8 inches per nanosecond. The manufacturer's data sheet indicates that the velocity factor of my RG223 cable is 0.66. To calculate the speed of the pulse in the coax cable, you multiply the velocity factor with the speed of light. The result is 7.79 inches per nanosecond. And here's the formula to calculate the length of the cable. This is to put our answer in feet. This is to take into account the return trip of the reflected pulse. We now need to enter our measured delay of 52 nanoseconds and we get an answer of 16.88 feet. Now with a calculation of uh, 16.88 feet and a physical, uh, I guess a rough physical measurement of um, uh, 16.5 feet, we're only a couple inches off, so our calculation is pretty accurate, but let's see what a TDR tells us the length of the cable is. So basically I got a TDR here and um, I can set up my cursors so basically my first cursor is basically at the zero point because I'm seeing I got almost at zero there and if I go to the second cursor and I move that to approximately uh, approximately right here. Uh, basically you can see my ohms cursor is saying about 52 ohms 
if I increase it, uh, I'm starting to increase, I'm starting to get the 58 ohms, so that's a little too high, so, so at about 52, 51 ohms there, um, I'm actually measuring 16.5 feet, um, don't know if you can see that with the camera, but it is 16 0.5 feet, so that is the physical measurement. So, uh, so the TDR is uh, definitely more accurate than the scope, but um, the calculation is uh, pretty accurate. You know, within a few inches, uh, you probably don't want to do a uh, use a scope as a TDR for extremely large runs as your air will increase. You can also determine the impedance of a cable by connecting a potentiometer to the end of the cable. So um, basically I have this potentiometer here, I soldered it to a BNC connector and I'll just uh, place it on to this cable. Now this potentiometer is a 10 kilo ohm potentiometer and it's turned all the way to one end which is 10 kilo ohms right now and uh, because the 10 kilo ohms is so much more larger than the um, uh, the 50 ohms of the cable the uh, pulse uh, looks uh, the same as in, as it did before when we had an open circuit. So as I adjust this uh, pulse to uh, or as I adjust the potentiometer to uh, closer to 50 ohms we're going to see the uh, reflection start to disappear uh, because more of the uh, uh, pulse is being dissipated into the potentiometer and right now I'm just going to set my volts per division to uh, half a volt and I'm going to try and match this to a perfect square wave and at this point um, the potentiometer should be at about 50 ohms and this is how you can tell uh, what the impedance is of the scope or of the cable um, uh, you can basically take this potentiometer off and measure it on a multimeter so basically I have this potentiometer on the multimeter and I'm reading um, about 56 ohms and that's pretty darn accurate you know that gives you a good idea of the impedance of the cable so let's see now what happens when you adjust the potentiometer to uh, lower than 50 ohms that's higher and we're going lower and basically what we see here is um, this this is uh, a portion of your incident pulse uh, because in a short your reflection um, uh, returns as uh, uh, 180 degrees out of phase with the incident pulse so um, all this area right here the incident and reflected pulse are cancelling each other out This is where the scope sees the rising edge of the incident pulse. This is where the trailing edge of the incident pulse occurs. This is where the scope first sees the reflection. And this is the trailing edge of the reflection.